Hey everyone, it's Kayla with Crunchyroll, and I'm here today with Kevin Pinkin, the composer for the soundtrack of Made in Abyss. How you doing? So, Kevin, why don't you give us just a short introduction? Who are you? Why should we care? Why should you care? I can't answer why you should care, but what I can say is that I am an Australian composer, currently living in London, and uh, yeah, I did uh, some music for, uh, as you said very kindly, uh, a show called Made in Abyss last year. Uh, and then I've also done music for video games, uh, the most recent game being a game called Florence that came out on Apple and Android on the 14th of February and March respectively. So there you go, that is me in a nutshell. Great, fantastic. Uh, so going back to Made in Abyss, could you describe, I guess, the general creative process you had with coming up with the music? Did you write with specific narrative moments in mind or was it more general than that? Um, it started off pretty general. Um, we didn't really know exactly what sort of music we wanted to write, and so as a result of that, uh, I was given uh, a, a wide berth to just sort of um, try some experimental things and try some, you know, things that you wouldn't typically hear um, in uh, sort of uh, in sort of the the realm of um, anime soundtracks. Um, and so, what was interesting is because I, I sort of harkened back to my. Um, uh, my art school days, I did an undergrad in sort of more experimental music and uh, that's always stuck with me. And so um, having the chance to like put some very crazy like sort of stretched samples of string orchestras or you know distorted vocals or things like that uh, was uh, was super super fun. And they just said, yeah, no, this sounds good. <laughs> just uh, keep on going. <laughs> so that, that's basically how it started and then we sort of developed it from there. What was the most important thing that you had in mind working on it? Uh, what did you want people to get out of the soundtrack? It's a pretty difficult question to ask now that I think about it. Um, I knew that what I wanted to do was um, create a, a very... Um, I wanted to have this quite intense juxtaposition between sort of close sounds and fast sounds and things like that. So I thought very texturally about the soundtrack. Melody and harmony at times sort of fell to the wayside while I was um, sort of trying to figure out like what different sound qualities could I could I do to represent certain visual artifacts, with, especially in the, sound, in the color palette and sort of like you, you see how there are a lot of like very far away objects. Uh, I mean the detail in the background art, um, Osamu Masayama, I mean oh my god. So um, there was a lot to work with in terms of depth, uh, like, phys like physical depth. So um, be able to, um, for example, uh, we recorded in a in a space called uh, the Synchron Stage in Vienna, and uh, this this stage is sort of meant for about 120, 130 people. We only had about 19, 20 people in there, mm. sort of recording, but we were recording all the space around it, so we could sort of actually play with those microphone positions as well to create the sort of juxtaposition between close sounds and far sounds, even if it was just a solo violin. Uh, going into more specifics, I know that one of the songs that was recorded for the soundtrack was written with vocals in a language that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you go a bit into why that decision was made? What was the, the sort of purpose of writing lyrics that were uh, in effect nonsensical? So I, uh, one of the bands that I listened to when um, growing up was a band called Siguros. And uh, so they um, very famously have, have sung in a sort of a gobbledygook language of, as they've referred to it at, at times, I think. Um, and what I found interesting about fake languages or just vowels that, you know, people can only pick up on certain things that, oh, that might sound like that word or something like that, is because um, you are able to then bring in your own experiences into a track, uh, in, into a song. So even though you might not understand lyrics or these particular lyrics, um, you might have some sort of associative memory or you might be able to pick out certain qualities in these sort of um, nonsense sounds that um, sort of in a weird abstract way sort of resonate with you. And I've been interested by that for a while. So, you know, sometimes I think language is a very appropriate, especially if you want to make a statement uh, and then picking a language, whether it be Swedish or whether it be English, etc., etc. But with gibberish, it's it's uh, sort of a, an open field and you, you take a bit of a risk. Sometimes people say, oh, I don't get it. Uh, and then other times the certain sort of ambiguous sort of quality to the vocals can uh, be perfect to uh, try and convey something that is stateless or countryless, yet at the same time has a lot of meaning. 
So having worked for both, could you get into some of the differences between composing for video games and composing for anime? Are there like challenges that are specific to each? It's interesting because uh, the start of the process is always the same. So uh, as we were sort of talking about a little bit before, like finding like one uh, sort of uh, unique quality about a, about a project uh, and then sort of running with that um, is sort of how I like to start. So you have a lot of freedom at the start and you don't worry about, okay, well, you know, is this interactive? Is this linear? Is it going to be written away from the picture to picture, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've, I very much am in the sort of the school of thought that, you know, uh, just get a lot of ideas down, uh, create your world and then kind of go from there. And then you start getting into, okay, well, games are linear. Sorry, uh, games are non-linear. So you've got to think of or compose mu music in a certain way. Uh, for example, you may uh, compose things in very, very small chunks and then just stitch them together later so that you have a lot of uh, movement with, you know, le you know, if you're changing levels or something like that. Whereas with, um, with Abyss, um, we uh, basically had this circumstance where we just wanted a lot of music away from the picture and we just wanted to cover a lot of um, sort of different bases. For example, uh, I had uh, four books, four, four of the manga books, and I would just go through and pick a scene and say, hey, that, either that looks really cool, or that line of dialogue is interesting there, or this relationship here is pretty interesting, so, you know, can we, uh, can we write to that, for example? So there was about a good half of the soundtrack was just all concept, uh, concept music that just ended up being in it. And once the, the team back in Japan were, were sort of happy with where things were going, they, we got more specific and said, oh, well, we need a bit more comedy music. I'm not very good at writing like comedy music, that's the only thing. <laughs> I'm very good at like breaking people's hearts, but not, you know, actually making people laugh. Got it. <laughs> so, you know, we'll see. But uh, yeah, so I think those would be like two examples of how they started the same in terms of concept or approach, but then uh, sort of um, veered very, very differently into sort of their own sort of realms. If you had the chance to rescore any video game, anime, film, Here we go. <laughs> any piece of media, what would you choose and how would you do it? So I got this question a couple of uh, months ago as well um, from the Canopy Effect and he said, oh, well, what, um, if, you, if you could like do something, what was your dream project? And I think that was it. It's like, mm -hmm. what, what is your dream project? And the answer I gave at the time was, actually, I'd rather just be a fly on the wall when, uh, for example, Cornelius was writing Ghost in the Shell Arise, when Yoko Kano was writing uh, Terran Resonance or something like that, I'd love to just see that process. That said, <laughs> there are definitely some shows that I, I know are in the, in the works or, or, or that have happened in the past. For example, like, I grew up watching Dragon Ball Z, Digimon, and Pokemon. Mm -hmm. Those are my, and I know that if I ever one day did a Pokemon score, no matter how small a part I played on it, I know I would die a happy man. But, uh, so yeah, Pokemon would be, would be, but you know, just obviously setting the bar quite low, you know, obviously, uh, yeah, that's not gonna happen. But uh, <laughs> then again, never say never, but uh, yeah, Pokemon would totally be a thing that I would totally do. Cause uh, then I could just be like, yeah, I wrote Pokemon. I wrote music for Pokemon. I can, just go, I can just retire now. That's a fantastic answer. <laughs> All right, I have a trio of extremely important and incisive questions to answer to Here we close go. out this interview. Okay. The first one is, if you were fighting a horde of zombies and you only had access to one weapon, what would you choose and why? Uh, ooh, okay, this is, this, this is a complicated answer. Um, I would probably go for flamethrower. Why? Because at least if you're going to die, you can go out in a, in a flame of glory. Ah, good answer. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll go to flamethrower. Okay. Uh, if you were a shonen manga or anime protagonist or hero, what would your special attack be? Ooh. Um, being able to power up for multiple episodes without having to say a line of dialogue. I'm afraid that one's already taken. No, who said that? <laughs> I will, f I will, I will fight them. <laughs> I will totally fight them, um, and then nothing will happen because we'll just be screaming for You'll five episodes. You'll just be powering up forever. Okay, well, curse you, whoever took my first <laughs> answer. But then I guess it. I guess the second would be. Uh, you know what, uh, the, the ability to teleport. I'll just, I'll just go the ability to teleport so I can just get out of this situation. Yeah, that would, that would, be, like my, that would be my second answer, which is not as cool as the first one, but I guess I, uh, I, I've, uh, I've been beaten. I've been well. beaten. Oh well. Um, all right, final question. Bring it on. 
if you could fist fight any classical music composer, who would you fight? Ooh, ooh, that is, uh, that is, okay, can I ask a, a quick context question? Oh, sure. Um, why are we fighting? Are we fighting for like, are we, um, are we angry at each other? Do we hate each other? Or is it just like a, a fun sparring match? Um, I will answer only with for glory. For glory, okay. Well, I am going to say, uh, he's not a classical composer, but there is a little tie-in. Um, Colin Stetson does um, an album called I Do This For Glory. And so I will meet him there and I will say, I will challenge you for your glory. So there we go. Well, there, there we, we go. go. <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much for coming Not in and doing an Not interview with us. It's been a huge pleasure. My absolute pleasure. It was a, it was really, really fun to be here. And uh, I've, I've been watching Crunchyroll content for a while. And it's always just really, really good to put some uh, faces to the names and just uh, be part of be part of an industry that I, I really, really, really care about and uh, I'm very passionate about. So thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And thank you all for watching. See ya. See you later.